Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kyla Hannington, and I'm the Public Engagement and Outreach Division Manager for the Prince George's County Office of Human Rights. It is my pleasure to welcome you to another event in our wonderful partnership series with the Prince George's County Memorial Library System and New Self Books. This is a big year for the Office of Human Rights and for the library system. The library celebrates 75 years this year, while the Office of Human Rights honors the 50th anniversary of our founding. And as we celebrate 50 years in existence, we look to the life of Teresa Douglas Banks, who was a fearless advocate in Prince George's County. She fought for many things. She fought for wage parity for African-American teachers, the formation of fire departments, the formation of our office, originally called the Human Relations Commission. She ran for school board. She served as one of the first council members for the town of Glen Arden and so much more. When I look at the life of Prince George's County and all the areas, I see the hand of Teresa Douglas Banks and her volunteerism and her commitment. Mm -hmm. So we look to Mrs. Banks' legacy and her commitment to bettering conditions for people throughout Prince George's County as a guiding light and inspiration for our own work with the Office of Human Rights. Thank you, Teresa Douglas Banks. And with me tonight as co-host is the Executive Director of the Office of Human Rights, Renee Battle Brooks. And our special guest is Joseph D. Caver, author of the in-depth study from Marion to Montgomery, the early years of Alabama State University. Mr. Caver is a former senior archivist at the Air Force Historical Research Agency at Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery, Alabama and current history lecturer at Alabama State University. He is co-author of the Tuskegee Airmen, an illustrated history, 1939 to 1949, and, an, and a contributor to the Air Power History Journal. Mr. Caver is a recipient of the Major General I.B. Hawley Award, recognizing significant contributions to the field of Air Force history. And he has been honored with the Spirit of Marion Award from Alabama State University. It is an absolute pleasure to have you with us tonight. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> so, Mr. Caver, we are so, again, very thrilled to have you and to really spend this next little bit to really um, talk through some of the amazing themes in your book from Marion to Montgomery. But I do wonder if there's a passage or two, or if you'd like to introduce your book, uh, lay a little foundation for those listening <laughs> who may not have had the opportunity yet to read it. Well, here's a copy and I urge uh, everyone who's interested in the study of African-American culture in America and the South uh, purchased the book. So this is how it starts. Uh, <laughs> I graduated from Alabama State University in 1974, and it celebrated this centennial celebration. And in 1975, I became the first black archivist for the state of Alabama. By the way, Alabama was the first state in the nation to establish its state archives and also perpetuate white supremacy, by the way, I have to say that. Uh, so while at the archives, I was uh, uh, working with patron and one of the patrons introduced me to the American Missionary Association papers. And there I located the incorporation of the Lincoln School at Marion. And I was fascinated. Uh, I had read about Marion through Horace Mann Bond in his book. And he had singled out that this particular area in Alabama was unique because it produced per capita more black PhDs than anywhere else in the world. And he could only tie it back to the school. Uh, talking to other historians, I came to learn that this school morphed into Alabama State University and thus began the journey of trying to document the history of this institution. Uh, so in 1982, I did my master's thesis and did a 20 year history, 1867 to 1887. And after I retired from working for the Air Force, my publisher, Randall Williams, who I'd known for years, uh, met him in the mid seventies while working at the state archives, he was working for Clan Watch, the Southern Poverty Law Center. So he urged me to turn my thesis into a book. And so after 40 years or more, I returned back <laughs> to doing research on this institution. 
and new information was available. Uh, it is a tremendous story. It really tells the story of the quest for education by almost a half million slaves here in Alabama. Uh, once they were emancipated, uh, education was looked upon as the panacea. So these nine black men are pioneers and uh, heroes that started this school. And of course, school started as a private school aided by the American Missionary Association and the Freedom Bureau. By 1869, it had received state funding, turning it into a normal school. If you're familiar with the concept of normal schools brought to America in the 1930s, I believe, from Germany to tackle the pervasive issue of uh, illiteracy in the population. But now for the black freemen, normal schools are being opened up. And this is the beginning of HBCUs uh, in mainly the South, some in Pennsylvania and of course, Missouri and other areas, but the South. And this journey is such a rich uh, journey filled with uh, tremendous obstacles, mainly white supremacy and white nationalists. Uh, these people want it to educate themselves, but that had to be controlled. And of course, we're all familiar with the Jim Crow system that we lived under up until the 1960s in Alabama, <laughs> even though uh, uh, Brown occurred in 1954. It's the Macon versus uh, Alabama Act uh, that basically integrated the school. But that's my story. And it's been a tremendous journey and I'm still gathering information uh, on this particular journey. There are a lot of heroes uh, uh, involved. Uh, the presidents in particular, one that stood out is Thomas C. Stewart, who was a union officer who came south, uh, had to, to withstand tremendous opposition. His wife had to sleep with a pistol and a pillow to fight off the Klan. <laughs> so this is a part of the story. Uh, it is forced out of Marion in 1887 because of racial conflict, mainly over uh, the Baptist squabble over how now Sanford University in Birmingham. Uh, so it's come to Montgomery, and lo and behold, it's established as the Colored People University. Uh, but someone filed the suit, and the lawsuit ended with no funding for. So for three years, between 1887 and 1890, this school existed without any funding. And it was the black community here in Montgomery that pulled together for the school survival. This same community would do the same thing in the 1950s with the Montgomery bus boycott, which basically started on the campus of Alabama State University. Uh, the freedom rides, uh, the student unrest, it's all tied to this one institution. I'm going to stop talking now and let someone else speak, uh, ask some questions. Well, you've raised so many things that I wanted to talk about. And I, I love um, sort of how how you wove the complexities of, just as you talk, sort of post-Civil War, the complexities between education and the former slaveholders and their thoughts and philosophy. Could you speak a little bit to sort of, you know, why why they were for education or a form of education and kind of speak to, I, I thought it was very revealing as to sort of uh, motives. I think uh, historian Walter Linwood Flemings describes it best. I think I used it in the text. Uh, uh, they didn't mind the education. It just had to be controlled by local conservative whites. And that's the issue here. And what type of education was being taught Hey, we getting into that now with the CRT mm -hmm. issue. Yes. <laughs> What's to be taught? <laughs> right. right. And, I, yeah. And, and it is, and so, and control of the finances and how much money is being sent. And of course, uh, much of the public fund would be diverted to the white institution versus the black institution. Right. That's the uh, Knight versus Alabama civil rights, I mean, the segregation case uh, confirmed. But right. this control, again, it, it won't go away. Here we are in 2022. Yeah. What's to be taught? How to, it should be taught? And of course, 
what's the capability of the people learning ability? And that was always in question. They call it the Negro problem. That's right. Uh, and of course, you, as you familiar with Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, and locally it would be William Byrne Patterson and William Hooper Council in Huntsville. Yeah. <laughs> this debate <laughs> over what type of education, industrial, vocational, liberal right. arts, right. it's it's a continuing. It's like Groundhog Day over and yes. over again. No, <laughs> Did I answer yeah. your question? <laughs> yeah, no, you're you're right. I, I was also struck by two things. One. Um, sort of this other narrative, everything that you said, but this other narrative about, well, we, we have to at least get some school here because everybody's going to leave and we still need the labor, right? So still using, um, using, uh, using people to, to do, uh-oh, uh, did I just go away? Sorry. No, we can hear no, you, but we, but you're, you're, uh, oh, there you are, you're back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, sorry. Uh, you know, at live theater, right? Yes. Um, but just, you know, how sort of it wasn't because they thought, you know, as you said, the Negro problem, right? It was all about, still about money, about using uh, us and about um, what our capabilities were. I was struck by um, one of the presidents, one of the early presidents, Peterson, right? Or or the found, right, the school in Marion before it, mm -hmm. before it moved, but sort of that... And I'm jumping a little bit ahead, but the uh, the the industrial versus the liberal arts, and I was like uh, one of the, the the curriculum. I thought right, Greek and uh, philosophy, French, German, Hebrew, chemistry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, fascinating. Where you know, in that pull with Tuskegee, right, and and Booker T and Council, right. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that. Right. <laughs> well, um, it's, I take John Henry Clark's uh, uh, role in that. I think in that argument, Booker T. Washington and Council and Patterson and W. E. Du Bois, they're all right in this approach. It took both uh, the industrial yeah. approach, the vocational yeah. approach, as well as the liberal arts. Uh, in the end, I think uh, their uh, interests were aimed uh, at the correct way to tackle uh, the tremendous amount of racism that they were facing off and the obstacles in front of them. So uh, working with your hands was not bad, but I think book, I uh, say somewhere in the book, uh, Patterson said, uh, you could not only work with your, you have to work with your hand, but you also have to work with your mind. Uh, yes. So it is a, it's a tremendous argument. But I would like to point out to you before we go forward, it was during this reconstruction period after the end of the Civil War that you really get a public education system in Alabama for all, not only black people, for white people for also. And this is in the form of a, a common school education, first through third grade. And you don't mm -hmm. get into the, the normal schools, take it to the eighth grade, and you don't get into the secondary aspect of it until the turn of the century in 1900. Uh, yeah. But again, we're, we're arguing over what type and how much and who controls it. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, Washington and Trim and council recognize that the white uh, rich industrialists in Pittsburgh and in New York and in Chicago, they were singing their songs. And uh, just look and uh, at the establishment of Rosenwald schools in the turn of the century, thanks to the donation of the Rosenwald Foundation. Uh, so, and this will be the morphing of, of training schools that will later become high schools in the state. So uh, that argument, I, 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 I would say both uh, portions would be correct. And we needed that both at, the, at that particular time. Yeah. And I'll, I'll ask one more. Oh, go ahead, Kyla. Oh, actually, ahead. just because it, it just fills into this. I was wondering if you could take our listeners through, our viewers, through what are um, the Rosenwald schools? Because I realize that's something that not everybody is familiar with. Can you explain that a little bit? Well, go to Fisk University <laughs> archives. <laughs> <laughs> have to give a plug uh, there. They have a database that identify all of the Rosenwald schools 
uh, found it in most in Alabama and the South. These are your two room schools uh, that provided education normally attached to a black church, an uh, elementary school. And so Booker T. Washington, through his outreach uh, through the Carnegie's, and he ran into, I forget his name, Rosenwald, but he's in a merit in the Seals and Roebuck fortune. And he donates millions of dollars in Washington see schools throughout the black and white community of Alabama and bring education to the state. Uh, so uh, uh, Google Rosenwald's uh, schools. Now, it's, uh, it's not enough has been published on this phenomenal event uh, that takes place in the first quarter of the uh, 20th century. Uh, but Booker T. Washington and his connection to the industrialists also aided him in building Tuskegee Institute. And it also aided Alabama A&M in becoming the uh, second Morrell land grant institution in the state. That argument was uh, played a role in those two institutions. And as you know, uh, after A&M won the 1890 designation, uh, Washington refused to quit. He went out and brought George Washington Carver to Tuskegee and founded the uh, uh, Agriculture uh, Extension Institute. So we basically in Alabama have three land grant institutions, Alabama a and Tuskegee, and of course, Auburn University. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know how I got to that discussion, but uh, I hope it, it uh, uh, is relevant to what we are talking about. That's tonight. great. Thank you. Thank you. And so, sorry, Renee, I, st I stole your question spot. So oh, no, 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 not at all. Because <laughs> this is still, uh, I, I wonder if you would mind explaining to those that are watching the paradox that is Patterson, right? Or Peterson, I keep calling him Patterson. Peterson, this, you know, this Scottish born guy and sort of, you know, this this person who while working before, you know, he teaches black people that he's working with during lunch and, you know, but yet the use of, you know, the N word and correspondence and can you just talk about the complexities of who he is and how it, it's just fascinating. It, because it is complex obviously, and it's not. Yeah. Obviously, you you read the book. Uh, oh yes. <laughs> and I've had. Uh, you really want to another source would be Judith Patterson, uh, Sweet Mysteries uh, about her family. It come from a very dysfunctional family, but we'll get back to William Burns Patterson. Uh, he and I asked Judith what changed. Yes. Uh, this man came to America uh, to earn his fortune. His brother went to Africa to do the yeah. same. <laughs> uh, and he traveled all over the country working odd jobs. He uh, was acclimated into the white supremacy of that time period. And he was, but he was fascinated with learning. And of course, his interest in, uh, in horticulture is another thing we'll talk about later. But he, was referring to his contract workers as niggers. Yeah. And his correspondent later, he started calling them my people. Yeah. Once he took up, he built the school there in uh, Greensboro. Uh, his whole attitude changed. Uh, I can see the change in his letters. Uh, but yet he would not take a position like Booker T. Washington, even when you counsel. Uh, did on the 1901 Constitution or any civil rights issue. He just went about his business, uh, educating his students, not encouraging activism uh, of any kind, uh, and teaching. Uh, and the students that he had appreciated that. They revered him uh, yes. because they think he was, uh, uh, Mary Terrell said he was sent by God. <laughs> this one yeah. student to answer that need. But uh, how would I classify him? He's, he, he is a paternalist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He starts off as a racist. He moderates his views. He becomes your classic Southern paternalist. Mm -hmm. He looks upon Black people as his children. Mm -hmm. uh, is that 
Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. No, no, you, you answered it. I mean, you really, because it is complex. And, and as you said, yet all of his students and the alumni are so very loyal Right, I believe that there are halls still named after him, or after you know, Toolberry. And, and or, listen, or, listen to this: Judith points out in her book, his children was ostracized because right. of his effort to educate black students. Right. And of course, though he ended up sending his kids to Auburn, right, <laughs> and coming back and building a, a business, a successful uh, florist business that started on the campus of Alabama State and right. was aided by the students there, Rosemont Garden. Uh, became very wealthy behind this uh, operation. He uh, he he was earning money. Uh, initially, though, uh, it's complex because, as you know, uh, the Klan was disbanded because of the incident at White Plains, Alabama, in right. the, by the Congress. And he knew the danger of working in Alabama, in particular working at black institution, because black white teachers were being uh, beaten and. Uh, lynched and shot. Uh, it was so. Why would he take this job under those conditions? I, I could not come to a conclusion. I cannot, and yeah. even his his ancestors cannot figure this out. Right. Now, uh, Judah did tell me his wife was a graduate of Oberlin College. Oh, right, <laughs> so and I saw that, and I thought maybe yeah. some of that. Yes, and she believed. Uh, Judith believed she. Uh, had aided him in this journey and uh, the moderation of his views. I'm yeah. just telling you what she told me uh, in, before she passed recently. Yeah. Uh, but uh, a fascinating tale, uh, guys. Uh, it's, I was at the, I'm vice president of the Friends of the State Archives and we had our uh, spring meeting on mm -hmm. Tuesday. And one of the things on the exhibit was this uh, black nanny, beautiful black woman. In her arms were two white girls, three, four years old, and they're looking at her and loving, admirable attention. And the nanny is, is smiling back at them. And I'm saying to myself, this is 1903 photo. Their dad voted to disenfranchise this black woman that his children love in Alabama. Yeah. Uh, it's, 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 yeah. I don't know how to put your arms around this. Mm -hmm. uh, you run across it in the Montgomery bus boycott with these housewives mm -hmm. and their relationship with their maids. And yeah. It's throughout history. It's yeah. so complex. Uh, this, they can deal with individual Blacks. It's the group, I think, that creates yeah. The conflict. It, it, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's it's fascinating. I, I, and then I I remember reading where his wife, upon her death, was buried in the black part of the cemetery. And you think you know, and he still didn't stop, right? So it's so you've got <laughs> you know, is it going along to get along? Is it? I, I mean, I I would like to believe that people can change, but that there's still even though you can change, that doesn't mean that your journey's completed, right? And, and that. Right, right. There, there's always, right, so the paternalistic, you know, whatever, that's at least a, a different part. It, it's arguably better, perhaps, than complete. I, I don't know. It's complex. I guess for me, it's just remembering to keep my mind open and try not to be judgmental, although it's easy. Because, <laughs> because it's, it's not, I don't know. I give people space to grow. And ultimately, in my belief system, God's going to be the one that takes care of that, not, you know, not what, me. Mm -hmm. What I tried not to do in this book would uh, be present uh, I didn't want to judge exactly by today's standard. I tried mm -hmm. to go back and capture the environment and the culture that I was writing about uh, yeah. and let the reader <laughs> uh, make up their own uh, determination on, on that. But uh, I think I somewhere I found a clip on Patterson where he said he never deserted his people. Uh, I had to go back. Yeah, <laughs> that caught yeah. me. That that little yeah. statement that, uh, uh, and so that yeah. sort of tells a side of him that contradicts all of his good works. So <laughs> it does. Uh, but yet, as you mm -hmm. said, that you know the children. Whoops, are you okay? Yeah. 
Hold it. Okay. By your butt. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, it's all good. Good. Um, but yet, as you say, the children suffered. And I think there's, there we go. The, the children were ostracized, his wife, and he ultimately was buried in the black right. part of the cemetery at, at the black part at that point. So it is fascinating. It's, it's, um, and then just one more. And then Kyla, I, I promise I always no, do this. You're good. No, 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 it's great. It's great. You're <laughs> just, you know, in the epilogue, it kind of ties up sort of this theme that, that we're talking about. And so Governor Graves, the same sort of paradox, right? that you see where he was in clan leadership for Pete's sake, right? And it's this, <laughs> right? And it's this, um, this uh, I, it, we even see it today in politics and I don't wanna get political, but we see it today in politics where do the ends justify the means? Is there a hill that you'll die on? Is there a moral compass that if it's crossed, it's too much, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I look at graves and you know, your book points out that he and other other white Southerners in that era, and I appreciate, and you did say that in the book, that, you know, you're, you're looking at through the lens of that time and how we interpret things differently now. But, but just that acknowledging that, yes, you know, joined it because you couldn't win political position without the Klan. But, um, and then, you know, sort of opportunistic, I think, as you said it, politically. Um, but then <laughs> disavowed it, at least Graves did. Um, and so I guess my question is, so Patterson, Graves, some of the others, like, do they justify <laughs> the means? Uh, I wonder. Well, <laughs> I also throw Hugo Black, uh, Chief yes. uh, Justice, Justice of the Supreme Court. There, uh, and, and I relied upon uh, uh, Virginia Durr's uh, work. You familiar with Virginia Durr? Her and her husband bailed uh, uh, with Rosa Parks, first attorney, and bailed out of jail. So white That's liberals, right. yes. uh, FDR, New Dealers, and uh, and of course you know the role of Hugo Black and his ruling on the Supreme Court, and blah blah blah. But they could not win in Alabama in 1926 without the endorsement of the Klan. Yeah. That that's that's the way it is. But what he did as governor, though, makes him the most progressive governor in the history of the state. Right. Now, personally, uh, my grandfather's brother, Jake, <laughs> was died at a prison camp, convict mm -hmm. lease system. Ugh. And I don't know if you're familiar with this, but this mm -hmm. yeah, but it's last, to some who may not. Yeah. Was the last state in the nation to end the convict lease system. It basically replaced slavery. That's right. And it, it was a revenue source for the state. So they, they would arrest people. My uncle, great uncle Jake, was arrested in Escambia County for con carrying a concealed weapon and sent to a prison camp in Shelby County where he died. Hmm. You Once you go in, you never get out. So oh. Hugo, I mean, uh, Graves ended the convict lease system. And to me, yeah. that's, I mean, that's monumental. Yes. <laughs> and yes. he also uh, extended Alabama State and made it a four year institution. Yeah. Yet mm -hmm. he was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. We're yeah. back <laughs> to your initial question: Who mm -hmm. were, who were these people? You mm -hmm. run across it with George Wallace uh, and his journey, his selection in 1958, and his change in 1962, no, uh, and his change in back. Who were these people? But basically, I can surmise that they sold their soul. To, for political power, yeah, and this is Machiavellian that is fine. It's uh, uh, I'm I was so honored uh, that uh, they renamed Bill Grace Hall at Alabama State after Joanne Robinson, who is a hero of the movement. She right. is the reason for the Montgomery bus boycott. Yes, and and Troy they named uh, the bill in after Congressman John Lewis, which is mm -hmm. which is great. Uh, University of Alabama had some problems, but they came back and named it a uh, young lady just died that integrated the university there. So mm -hmm. uh, we, the boards and the governing bodies are basically Black Lives Matter. That's mm -hmm. the fact coming out mm -hmm. of that movement. And so now people are really going back and looking at Hugo Black and Bib Grays and uh, other people of that era and do they mm -hmm. deserve 
course, we got major battle here in Montgomery with our state capital loaded down with Confederate heroes, and particularly right. the yeah. uh, mm -hmm. father of our supposedly uh, gynecologist, uh, <laughs> uh, J. Marion Sims. Uh, Interesting. Who, that is a touchy one there. <laughs> but I'm getting off subject, guys. I don't know. No, 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 no. This is all on, right? Yeah. But, but uh, it really it really helps us to to understand that mm -hmm. like each of us, we 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 can't be dogmatic. Um I don't know. Yes, yes. It comes back to mm -hmm. like there like where where's that line? Mm -hmm. Can we but, judge? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but our answer my ancestors had to live. And under that condition, and uh, they had to continue to fight uh, at the uh, dedication of the Joanne Robinson uh, rededication. Fred Gray was the featured speaker, and he talked about his class, class of 61, the three Freds. Uh, of course, everybody knows what Fred Gray has accomplished. His name is on most civil rights uh, cases uh, of the civil rights era, but uh, Fred Shuttlesworth. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, leading the Birmingham movement, uh, and Fred Reese and Selma. Selma, Montgomery, and Birmingham, all the leadership was uh, accumulated, was nourished there at on the campus of Alabama State University. Yeah. And of course, you got these black women, so the Women's Political Council, <laughs> they are. Uh, now, here, this is the question I get all the time. Why did the black women take a leadership role? Why not the black men? Yeah. And of course, <laughs> and of course, Joanne Robinson and other professors, they lost their jobs behind their activism. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Lawrence Reddick ended up in New York at Schomburg. But these are great professors, great uh, uh, motivators. <laughs> and uh, when I think of uh, Jackie Trumbull, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Callum, I think of Joanne Robinson. Mm -hmm. I really do, uh, mm. and, and the motivation. And I was lucky. I was taught by uh, Miss Thelma Glass. She was a member of the WPC, and uh, uh, Reverend B. J. Sims. He was on the Montgomery Improvement Association original board. These are a part of my legacy and where I grew up. And so when I sat down to write the book, uh, I have to consider all of that and recognize. This journey has not been easy, mm -hmm. and and the, and the, and the path forward would not be easy. We got yeah. these same issues that was being argued over in 1867, 1887, and 1901, we're still having that debate today. Yeah. <laughs> now that's frustrating. That yes. is frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it, yeah. But we, we, I think we've here in the state, we moved uh, uh, Bill Gray's and uh, Hugo Black is untouchable uh, <laughs> because of his role on the Supreme Court. Uh, mm -hmm. But other than that, uh, and yet with all of the buildings named after George Wallace, uh, what to do about that? So. Wow. That I'm sorry for interrupting you. Now yeah. you can go ahead. That's <laughs> no, good. And I'm sorry, Kyla, I said I wouldn't, but that's something go, that go, go, go. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you talked about people losing their job because of activism. And I, I, I would want you to just comment a little bit on Dr. Trehomes, the son, and sort of when, the, you know, the boycott and, and all of the things and the students, the, the marching to the, you know, all of this and how the, again, all white board you know, demanded that he suspend students and fire, you know, the, the teachers and all of this. And he did everything, yet he <laughs> retired, right? And I'm so sad that he dies, like, you know. Yeah, they killed him. Exactly. He, he, he worked himself to death. Exactly. Uh, but <laughs> kind of talk about that and just, again, it's it's the same thing, but a different perspective, because some would say, oh, well, you know, Trey Horn should have, you know, he sold us. Right. I mean, I don't know, like the different things that people can say, but it's not so rigid as it's not clear cut. Right. Uh, you're talking about a Morehouse man who followed yeah. in his father's footstep yeah. uh, and he takes over the school on his father's death. And of course, he's similar brilliant faculty. Mm -hmm. And he builds this university and turns it into the premier uh, uh, 
teacher college in America, really, for black teachers all over the country are coming. Yeah. They are in demand for black yeah. teachers. And he is not only a leader academically, but in other areas, his church, the YMCA. But in 1931, uh, he starts a program with uh, uh, the NEA, and it's the Negro History Project. Of course, he's friends with Carter G. Woodson and all of the historians of that time. Uh, and he accumulates studies on Black students and teachers in the state. And according to John Hope Franklin, they use this data in the Brown versus Board of Education. So this is uh, Dr. Tremont. He uh, 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 keeps the school open during depression. Uh, the Bama State Collegian, like the Fist Jubilee Singers, go out and raise money to keep the school open. Uh, the the Turkey Day Classic, the game between Tuskegee and Alabama State, was used to pay the salary of uh, teachers and faculty members. Uh, so we're still having some buffer initiatives. <laughs> so, um, yeah. but in the middle of the Civil Rights Movement, uh, he is working for a white segregation governor and the white uh, school board. And the students were on fire. They had gone, of course, with the bus boycott. A bunch of students had gone to uh, North Carolina a and came back with the fear of a student protest. And of course, uh, the board and the governor wanted Trenton to expel them. He tried to protect them, but he lost. In the end, he retired. He's forced to retire in December of 1960, and he dies the next month. He gave his life to the institution. A great man, uh, really, truly a great man. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted uh, our viewers to really hear that. Okay, Kyla, I'm going to I'm going to uh, stop for a moment. And let you. I love your questions, so don't worry. You're doing. I mean, it's just such a wonderful conversation. Um, well, one thing that I wanted to talk about, and I think is such a crucial piece, and, and we kind of hinted at it back backstage, which was the the significance of HBCUs. And and Alabama, I mean, we're talking Alabama um, state specifically, but in general terms, can you talk about the? the I don't want to. I don't want to offer any leading adverbs or adjectives, but just can you, can you talk about the significance of HBCUs generally? Um, yes. If I can read, uh, I was talking about Judith uh, Patterson. She mm -hmm. wrote something that captured my attention. Uh, she claims, and I agree, that these HBCUs are the key to the development of the Black middle class not only in Alabama, but in America. Without the HBCUs, you would not, our black middle class would not be as formidable as it was. You wouldn't have the, the Hall and Renaissance and all of the art and the uh, other things that we accomplished. So the, the development of the black middle class is key. And this is uh, one of the major role of the HBCUs. It also, uh, the nourishment that I was describing to uh, Miss Brooks about her mother when she got the oak wood. Uh, it is uh, something uh, I've been to white campus. My sisters went to white PWI institution, but it's something different when you walk on a black campus. Uh, it is <laughs> uh, the students uh, seem to be a little more relaxed, a little mm -hmm. more themselves. Uh, uh, it's it's quite an experience, uh, and maybe I've been away so long. I can just observe when I drive through campus, and of course the fraternities, sororities, the the band, the the, the all of the cultural activities, uh, the theater arts, uh, the music, uh, and now, believe it or not, the stems uh, here at Alabama State, the mm -hmm. stems are really growing. In fact, uh, I just attended my niece's graduation. There were less than 30 educators. <laughs> and out of uh, 400 graduates, the rest were in STEMs or other areas of study. So that same issue that Dr. Trenton uh, faced in the 1920s about Black teachers, we are facing today. 
uh, mm -hmm. some way we're going to have to get these uh, biology and these STEM majors to go back and get that education degree to teach our kids. Yeah. Uh, and of course, we're going to have to pay more. I understand why uh, the students are not majoring in education is because of the pay and the uh, lack of uh, uh, respect. Uh, and so, um, mm -hmm. but we, we some way we have to turn it around. And of course, this university legacy is built upon teacher training. <laughs> but uh, right yeah. now, the other areas are outperforming than uh, it in, uh, in 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 education wise. It's funny because uh, I'm sorry. I, I, no, 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 that's good. And I, I was clapping only because STEM seems to be forgotten a lot, and, I, and and to have that as you know. But I hear what you're saying. It the whole history of the university was teachers to teach. Um, right, right. And yeah. I don't know what's going on in Maryland, but in Alabama, we have a, a unique teacher shortage coming out of this mm -hmm. pandemic. Uh, not enough support staff. Mm -hmm. And of course, the pay is atrocious. So mm -hmm. I can understand a, a, a student not deciding to get a BS in biology instead of a BA in biology. So yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. such a good. Uh, so point. that's what we are. Yes. Yeah, Carla, did you have another question or? Um, not about HBCU specifically. I was I was going for that. You got there, which was the what we <laughs> talked about backstage, which is that nourishment quality. Yeah. that the support and i think i look at alabama state university and we talked about jackie trimble we have you there's so many um leaders from the civil rights movement of the 1950s 1960s so this institution is um has and continues to to uh develop such incredible uh thinkers and speakers and writers and activists like it's really a phenomenal for one institution and um I guess for me, that's looking at that power and the um, nourishment of the HBCU generally. It's a, it's an incubation period. I I, I can I teach uh, freshman world history, and on um, this uh, past Friday graduation, several of my students came up and hugged me, uh, mm. and to see that maturation from being an 18 year old freshman to a 21, 22 year old senior graduate with the future already most men already have jobs and uh, mm -hmm. so uh that is encouraging but uh it is uh i also have relatives who uh went to pwis mm -hmm. and they have to come back to the uh, hbcu for parties and to have fun believe it or not mm -hmm. <laughs> that is a, 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 a phenomenon uh and we're waiting to graduate school to pledge a fraternity and a sorority instead mm -hmm. of going to the undergraduate. So uh, it's, it's, we're on a stage right now uh, where I think we're, the, the country is looking back on the role of HBCUs and also recognizing the value that HBCUs have contributed to the well being of this country and the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and uh, so, I like the emphasis. Uh, I hopefully uh, we'll see an uptick in enrollment and uh, and and maintain and continue this culture. I, I'm sort of greedy uh, that I believe there are only two black institutions left in in America. That's the black church and UHBCUs, and we have to fight to keep those two institutions alive. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, when you just said that, it reminded me of, I was fascinated by this whole intrigue about moving the school and, you know, could you talk a little bit about sort of this, um, the dynamic of um, the white Baptists and all the plotting <laughs> and the right between, I'm back to Patterson and, <laughs> and council and this whole maneuvering and well, if you, do, right, it was fascinating, this whole chess game. <laughs> And well, how religion played a part, or religious mm -hmm. as a corporate. It all starts uh, with uh, how college cadets walking on the sidewalk, and uh, uh, two young black me uh, men from Lincoln refuse to get off the sidewalk. So uh, a conflict occurs, and he cuts them, and uh, they chase him to Henrietta Curtis' house, who protects him, draws a, a gun on them to keep the mob at bay. But the mob, the people use that as an excuse to 
uh, remove the university. But behind the scene, which had been in discussion for several years, was to move uh, Sanford, I mean, Howard College out of Marion because after the Civil War, the area was uh, losing population influence and this new magic city up in Birmingham just took off out of nowhere after the Civil War. Uh, so, but the local whites, Baptists, wanted to keep Howard and they felt like by removing Lincoln, they could keep the local white Baptist college there. And of course, in August of 1887, uh, Howard went to Birmingham, became Sanford University, and Lincoln went to Montgomery and became Alabama State University. And Marion and that whole Black Belt region is still struggling because of losing these institutions. Mm -hmm. Over in Greensboro, uh, later they will lose the Southern College and move to Birmingham to become Birmingham Southern College. Uh, so you had all these institutions in the Black Belt. And if you know anything about the Alabama Black Belt, the poverty rate, uh, we are last in everything really over there. Mm -hmm. Predominantly black uh, counties, uh, but they lost these institutions. Now the Lincoln School that I'm talking about, they revised it in 1894 with the aid of a teacher from Caledonia College, <laughs> by the way, uh, American Missionary Association right. and Congregationalists. And they kept the school open to 1969 when they closed it for immigration reasons. The county took over the school in 1942 and started paying the teacher's salary. It was a private black school, similar to Southern Norma in Bruton, Alabama. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, the president of Hampton University, what's his name? Uh, he's a graduate of uh, Southern Norma. <laughs> and these were these boarding schools. Uh, tremendous story. We were talking about Rosenwald schools. Um, Wilcox County Presbyterian effort in establishing boarding schools for black uh, 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 residents to go to school. You could and remember in most of your small towns, you can only go first through the third grade. But now with these days of the Presbyterian, the congregationalists, you could go up to the eighth grade and get a teacher certificate. Uh, I, I I don't know how I got to that, but I hope it answers your question. No, it does. It does. Um, yeah. Um, well, I have a I have kind of a side question, but I'm hoping we can. I do want to just do this really quick. But first of all, let me just say that anybody who's watching, please feel free to type in questions in the chat. We can share them. We can see them. And so we'd love to hear from you. Please don't be shy. Um, I, you had mentioned New South Books and particularly Randall Williams. And I just saw that New South Books made an announcement today that they have been bought by or are amalgamating with, I guess, bought by the University of Georgia mm -hmm. Press. And so you, New South Books are event partners for this event and many, many other wonderful um, events with incredible writers like yourself and great people. And I just thought, if we could just take a minute and just talk about New South, can we just talk about New South Books for a minute? Because yes, it seems like pretty yeah. big news. Yeah. Well, let me tell you about my relationship with Randall Williams. <laughs> uh, I told you about working at State Archives, and he's working for uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center, a Klan Watch project. And then we started playing basketball <laughs> together. <laughs> uh, and our friendship just goes back that uh, many years. And so we were at a uh, college baseball game back, what is this, May? This had to be February or March. And he was telling me about the transaction between New South and Georgia Press. He said, don't mention it. So, <laughs> uh, they basically will have the same leeway that they have now, except mm -hmm. they'll be owned by Georgia Press. Mm -hmm. uh, Randall mm -hmm. has agreed uh, to continue his editing role, uh, and uh, Suzanne uh, will work for Georgia Press as a publisher in some role. They will keep their namesake, allow mm -hmm. them to keep their faith at New South. And from what Randall is telling me, and we're the same age, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, he's looking, he has a down uh, condo downtown. <laughs> Uh, in, a, in three to four years for him and Suzanne to spend six months in New York, where she's from, and six months in Alabama. <laughs> okay, okay. I said, well, what are you going to do with the bookstore? And he's going to open it up into a major cultural bookstore. 
they will continue to publish on the Georgia Press, but they will sell books and distribute books and African artifacts and other things that they have in the bookstore if you've been mm -hmm. there. Uh, so <laughs> after Good I saw the news this morning, I called him and he was laughing. He said, now you can talk about it. But right. uh, they are happy. They're coming okay. out awesome. uh, looking good. And this. so New South still uh, exists, but it's on the uh, Georgia Press. Yeah, awesome. that's your answer. Kyle. Yeah. No, that's great. <laughs> okay. I, I just want to give them a shout out because we've been working with them now on these series for, I think, two years. They've been wonderful event partners. And I wanted to take a moment because this is big news today to acknowledge their efforts and, and also their gift to Prince George's County because it's been really nice for our county to be able to bring in so many amazing authors like yourself. Oh, Thank well, you. Well, it's been a wonderful <laughs> well, well, maybe this is the thing we're talking about news. Um, maybe I could ask you to comment, you know, particularly given sort of the themes in your book about sort of the violence and that, right, not wanting students to black students to, to learn, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, and we talked about it a little bit before we uh, went live mm -hmm. tonight, but mm -hmm. the, the Delaware State um, stopping of the, the women's um, bus on their way through Georgia and, uh, you know, it's not settled. Again, I don't have any facts. I just have what I heard <laughs> on the news. Um <laughs> And uh, just sort of, you know, the 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 search and I, what struck me from what uh, the news report, it was sort of the the trauma, the traumatizing nature that these young students went through um, by being pulled over and having their belongings search. Of course, nothing was found, but sort of talk to us about that and sort of some of the themes <laughs> in your book. And it's, you know. Is uh, it's it's unfortunate, but uh, welcome to America. <laughs> that's that's the only thing I can say to those students. Uh, uh, if they read the history of the struggle uh, with the uh, man at uh, Tennessee State at at uh, next at Fifth when he was preparing those freedom riders to go south. Oh, These are yes. college students yeah. being beaten and brutalized. Yeah. Uh, it's nothing new. Uh, we, we would like to think we are beyond that, but if you've been paying attention to news and uh, the coverage of these incidents, they are still occurring like they occurred in 1961 with the, uh, John Lewis and those people effort to secure the right for the transportation uh, in America. But it's, it's throughout our history and I was um, uh, even was talking about the situation there in Mary and that fight. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Getting off the sidewalk. Uh, oh. yeah. But when you get here to Montgomery, uh, the, uh, the, the lynching and the brutality of black, uh, white police is, is horrendous. It lead one black newspaper art, uh, editor, Jesse C. Duke to write an editorial which basically inflamed the situation more about mm -hmm. uh, the, he accused the white Juliet of being attracted to the black Romeo. Oh, yes, yes, I remember that. <laughs> and, and all hell breaks out. Yes. Uh, uh, so, but, but Duke is saying, he's just writing after seeing a black man drag, his body drag down this avenue, bully mm -hmm. ridden and cut into pieces. And he was just frustrated with it. Now, it didn't aid the, re uh, the settlement of the school here because it turned the whites, more whites against the relocation That's of right. the school. But this is one of the incidents. In 1919, uh, a block from the school campus, uh, if you go to the uh, EJI, uh, you'll see there were three men lynched mm -hmm. here in Montgomery County. Mm -hmm. One a block from the school uh, at, in a hospital, in, uh, the health infirmary. So th these students knew the violence and the implication of Jim Crow. This generation may assume that it doesn't exist, mm -hmm. but somewhere in their lives, they will always come back to haunt them. Say, look, you're different. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, <laughs> it's, and that's just the way it is. It's real. Mm -hmm. 
if you not uh, wish it away and imagine it's not good. Oh, I think we we may have lost Mr. K. Okay, are you minute. back? Oh. Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. Okay, great. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, um, that was uh, uh, just welcome them to America. Really, that's my take on it. It's, oh, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's unfortunate. Yeah. It's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so, Carla, you've got a question from one of our. We do. We have a question from a viewer. What are some ways you would suggest to get more youth? interested in learning black history <laughs> that is a fascinating question i live in montgomery one of the most historic cities in, in the country uh, i mean it affects the history of the world uh, but i lead tours and people come from all over the world to tour the eji uh, uh yes. the rosa parks <laughs> museum <laughs> and yet <laughs> My students, while they, like I'm telling you, they're spending their four years on campus, uh, they are not partaking in the uh, the historical museums and learning uh, facilities that are available to them until they get close to their junior and senior year. But the freshmen and the sophomores, they're just not interested in that. Just now. It's not on uh, social media. It doesn't exist <laughs> for them. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can tell you uh, that many uh, outsiders, uh, young people, are coming to visit the EJI. If you haven't been to EJI, bring your napkins with you because yes. it's going to evoke some emotions that uh, you never thought you had. Uh, so uh, we are becoming a destination for tourism from all over the world and the country uh, now. But getting the locals, and, and that includes the college students, to focus and concentrate on this. And maybe uh, Alabama State is starting to master in public history with uh, creating, uh, looking for internships, and they're partnering with EJI and the State Archive. So mm -hmm. maybe that will, for history majors. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know about the journal, that biology major, that STEM major, how are you going to reach them um, yes. in this culture? Yes. <laughs> But yeah, uh, yeah. we, hmm. we, we are uh, working, we're hosting a SALA uh, annual uh, uh, convention in September and October, last week of September, first week of October. They was here last in 1957 and Dr. Trenlin was the host. Uh, and so we're expecting two to 3,000 historians to come. Uh, the state, the city, the universities, everybody's involved, tourism. Uh, we're working on a tour guide. And so we've been, all of the sites here in Montgomery, Selma, um, Birmingham, mm -hmm. Tuskegee. And one of my daughter, she suggested do a QR code. Yeah, right, right. Smart. <laughs> and get the kid and the cell phone and there your data and photos. There you uh, go. So, so we're trying to modernize and we're trying to keep up with the the next generation or the future generation uh but sometimes uh that that could be extremely difficult i myself stand up in class and start talking about movies that i've seen and my students mm -hmm. look at me and they say you're crazy and we've never seen anything like <laughs> that they're relating to past events but I, uh, of course, I'm guilty of nostalgic. So, <laughs> well, I mean, I think we learn. We learn from what's happened before us. Um, mm -hmm. I know that we only have a minute left, but you know, I, I was also, um, as I was reading, you know, when you got to 1915, and I'm thinking, you know, Birth of the Nation, the release of that movie, and sort of that juxtaposition. When you got to 1918, I was thinking about our brave soldiers that fought and how we, you know, how the government asked, like, the community, the gardens, and all of these things, and how, like, you know, there, this, it, this, nothing is reciprocated. Um, but mm -hmm. it's, it's just fascinating because it's so layered, but yet there's this loyalty to everything. Loyalty. Mm -hmm. Right, to the ideal, yeah. Yeah, that's the African study for uh, uh, Amer African American Negro history and life. Uh, Carter G. Woodson, original uh, organization. I'm not sure I've got the acronym right. Uh, uh, 
you can look it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm sure yeah. Kyla's doing that now. That's, but... that's Lorraine uh, Griffin. She put that. Yeah, I, I tried to find that too, but I will, if Asala, I can get it, I'll put it in the chat. A S L A H, I think. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I should be better than that, but my uh, senior yep. is a plays a role in some <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. Yeah. Yes. Big, here we big go. So I'm going to get this in the chat right here and I'm going to put it up on the screen. And then I also have the. Um, the bad news of saying that we're actually we have come to the um to the end of time unfortunately so i have to say mr caver it has been so interesting we could talk to you for another hour at least many many more hours <laughs> so, um we thank you so much for being with us um it's just been fantastic and thank you so much for your work uh i also want to thank everybody who tuned in and joined us tonight and uh for questions and just being part of everything that we're doing here with the office of human rights and the library um, I do want to uh, suggest that people check out the library's website at pgcmls.info slash events to see what is going on uh, and the library has upcoming and also to visit our website civilrights.mypgc.us to see what we have in the future. Um, and it's just been a pleasure again, Mr. Caver, to have you tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you to you, Renee, as co-host. You were awesome. No, and thank you. This was my <laughs> pleasure. Um, I also want to give a shout out and a thanks to our friends, New South Books, with their big, exciting announcement today. Uh, it's been really wonderful. And congratulations to you, New South. Uh, so everybody, good night. And uh, we'll hope to see you for a new event soon. Thank you. Thanks.